both brands that lead culture are more uh, influential and more successful than those who follow it. Makes sense to me. Um, seeking to fill a void that exists in the marketplace in both more music and advertising, he raised capital and introduced United Masters, whose mission is to allow artists to get fans, get smart, and get paid. United Masters offers a revolutionary ecosystem for both artists and advertisers, where storytelling, culture, and technology uh, converge. Steve is the former president of Interscope Records and the author of The Tanning of America, How Hip Hop Traded a Culture That Rewrote the Rules of the New Economy, and most recently the producer of the controversial new documentary, Stu Matthew. You guys watch Stu Matthew? Came out on Tuesday? Okay, they won't watch it. Um, uh, sorry, with Lon James and Matt Carter's Spring Hill Entertainment, and it's the new on HBO this past week. So, uh, before I bring him out, we're going to have a little bit of video and then, uh, and then conversation. Let's watch this video. The founder and chief executive of Translation is a former record label executive and also the author of the new book, The Penny of America. A man with balance, passion, energy, an advertising executive of the year, an author? I don't understand. Mr. Steve Stubbs is. Yes. yes. Soundtrack to Man in Black in 1997, 
which was crazy was the soundtrack had sold 10 million copies. And everybody was super excited about that. But no one was paying attention to the fact that the glasses were selling. Yeah, the And I kept on thinking about the glasses. Like, why are these things making all the money? Like, and we are not participating in any of this. And that didn't get lost on me because we were successful. And um, when I got, when I left Sony and went to Interscope, some of the things that I started to do was bring over um, brands. So they would start participating in music videos and uh, underwriting music videos and do brand integrations. And I was the thinking, but I'm like, that's cool, but if I leave the business entirely, I could be, be much more impactful. And the first thing I did when I left the business was I did the Jay-Z sneakers, the 50 Cent sneakers, and the Pharrell sneakers, and those things went crazy. And I knew that I could do that, right? And so was part of that about realizing that the, the, the music is driving culture and the real monetization is coming on the cultural side. That's right. I always, how do you turn cultural currency into financial currency? I've always been in that business. That's why I wrote the book, The Tanning of America. Like, I wish everybody could just go read that book. I, I mean, I gave it all away. I gave, the, I gave the game away seven years ago. What you're seeing right now today is not even close to surprising, because I wrote about it. Um, because it's clear to me that that's my number one talent. I, I know what my talent is. I, I can see around corners, specifically. I, um, it's what I think about all the time. It's what I dream about. I can see what's going to happen before it happens. And none of what you see today is surprising, which probably um, the most surprising is the fact that we're not capitalizing on it as fast and as, um, as much of us should be capitalizing on it. We are creating culture. When I first got into the advertising business, I'd go into rooms and they'd be like, okay, we're gonna spend $100 million, or we're gonna spend $13 million against, um, against African Americans because African Americans make up 13% of the population. Okay, except that makes no sense because they're doing 70% of the cultural impact. They're driving contagion, so you should spend 70% of the money against African Americans since they're the ones driving the insights. If you're not leading, if you're not a brand leading with ethnic insights, you're done, right? So that's what I've been preaching the entire time. So now, why United Masses? Because I think that because music has now gone completely digital, and there's nobody right now trying to think they're going to make money off a CD anymore, that, like that, 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 that advance and um, uh, ways to monetize a CD is done that you can take these digital signals and then do the same thing that Zynga did, do the same thing that Amazon has done, figure out that people, if you go on Amazon, you know, people who like Pharrell also like 103,000. That's fine, because you stay within that infrastructure and you buy from the Pharrell song, you stream it, and you go to, but that's not what the artist really want. It's like people who listen to Pharrell buys his sneakers, and there's a link to his sneakers. Yeah, we and it's like, and, and so how do you connect the most engaged to the artist that is the author of the reason why you're even like a fan of, of paying attention to what's going on. I think those things are, are bringing CRM tools to artists. CRM tools are what these companies use, customer relationship management tools, so that you can actually figure out who's, best, who's streaming your music and then be able to upsell them whether it's merch or experiences, whatever it is, if you get that right, whether you have 30,000 fans or 5 million fans, you'll be able to maximize the monetization yeah. of whatever you create. We talk about this in our investment portfolio at Techstars all the time, which is if you show me your record collection of music you listen to, I can tell you what kind of jeans you wear, what kind of sneakers you wear, I can probably tell you what your favorite sport is, like you can yes. dig into that and know, and the only way you can Properly monetize that is if you have a direct connection with your fan base and you communicate with them directly and you, and you understand who they are. Yeah, I, will, I, I have no problem talking. We, I think we have one hour. If you're filming this, it's fine. I just don't want you to get caught up in getting the angle right 
and not paying attention um, and cut the ringers off because I want to get into this. I think it's important. Um, I think the journey that I've had from a regular ass kid who went to five colleges and didn't graduate to being a road manager, a kid who played, to building a company, to running companies and building companies. I think everybody in this room falls within one of those buckets. So if there's something I'm going to say that's extremely important and applicable to you, just please, I don't, I don't want anybody to not get every ounce of what I'm willing to give away this morning. Let's, let's do this really quickly. Show of hands if you are an artist. Okay. 40 to 50 percent. Uh, manager, record label, like business side. Okay. Uh, entrepreneur. Um, yeah, entrepreneur. Like, that's should be everybody's hand, right? <laughs> let's try that again. Entrepreneur? Yeah. Okay. Um, technologist. Like developer, startup founder. Okay. It's all the right room. Listen, you know, in um, in sports, we used to watch uh, in basketball the center, uh, the big tall guy. It was cool for him to come down the court last and not be able to shoot the jumper because he was a big guy. He'd be in the middle and get there. Everybody's supposed to be offense, and that was then. And then now. You're not like a complete big guy unless you actually can run fast and shoot the jump. You don't qualify. The big slow guy don't matter no more. You gotta be Anthony Davis. Man. As entrepreneurs, if you're gonna really disrupt the next generation of businesses, I think it's the convergence of these three skill sets: culture, technology, and storytelling. If you are not fluent at two or three of those languages, you're done. So you can't be on the culture side too cool to mess with the nerd, and you can't be the nerd. I, when I started building United Masters, I'd go out to San Francisco, and I would go look for these engineers, and I would say, you know what? Guys, I'm telling you right now, I'm looking for guys who are great engineers, who love culture. I, for one, if it was 1985, would not have hired Bill Gates. They look at me like crazy. I'm like, no case can give a shit about Run DMC. <laughs> like, I mean, you need people who are leaning into culture to understand where this whole thing is coming together. It's not disrespect to Bill Gates. Obviously, you get that. I'm saying, for what I'm building, I'm sure I think the amplification is when you put culture and technology together and you have storytellers around it. And building a company that has that skill set to me is very, very important. In fact, let me just keep going, that in San Francisco, our office is in the dog pad section of San Francisco. And to prove this out, I have only, it's a loft space that I rented downstairs. Of the, there was a loft on the second floor, it was an art gallery when I got the building uh, downstairs. And I put on the second floor all the engineers are working up there. And in the gallery space, I made this sneak store a uh, clothing store called Stash. And you'll go there and you'll see 250 kids lined up for a shoe drop with guys upstairs coding. It's like, I just stand and look at it and go, doesn't everybody know this? This is it. And the engineers can't believe they're walking past kids who are looking to buy the new off-whites or whatever. And they're upstairs trying to write code that's going to help them multiply the effect that culture has. I think that's important. And like I need everybody in this room support. Because what I'm, I've always tried to do things that move culture forward and wasn't on some bullshit like, ah, I ain't gonna say, I, I wrote a book about it. Then I did a documentary about it. And then like had Kerry Washington do the audio version of the book. I want everybody to know about it. I'm not doing this shit for money. I can't make money with a book and all that. I don't that ain't what I, I want everybody to know stuff. So what you're talking about there is about inclusive, right? Being inclusive. Historically, both tech and music have been pretty exclusive. High bar of entry, hard to get inside, hard to stay inside once you're in. Like, do you see in the streaming world, in a sort of democratized world where anybody in here can create great tracks and distribute them to the rest of the planet. How do you see being able to help and move 
a lot more artists, a lot more people, right? How do, how do you apply that inclusivity to actually giving people help and advancing their careers? Well, I think we need to um, reevaluate our expectations of what success is, right? I said, if you have 30,000 fans and you know who those fans are, that's a real business. It's, it, you, you can't be, if I'm an artist, if it was me, I wouldn't be like sitting there going, like, it's either Drake or Bust. It's either me, like that's not the business. The business is how do you maximize the amount of people that you have? You know, they, they build um, uh, Etsy. Etsy is like, you know what? I make 5,000 scarves. That's all I make. I hand make these scarves. If you had gone to mushrooms and you said, oh, I can make this 5,000, they'll be like, oh, sorry, you need a 10,000 minimum to get the end. Now you have somebody sitting in Chattanooga, Tennessee that makes 5,000 scars and they make a great living. They don't have to wait tables. They can make do what they love and earn a living because Etsy allows small batch um, uh, distribution. Music is the exact same way. You don't have to be in the top 2% in order to rock. Jazz musicians figured this out years ago. How do you use technology today to help inform who your fans are, who the most engaged are, where you should talk? And the other thing is, uh, don't, let, don't get fooled by the word like, the word data gets thrown around so much, and it means so many different things to so many different people. For me to tell you, um, data says that 50% uh, uh, of your fans are in Atlanta. Like, I'm from Atlanta. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> we had that patient talk that everybody would always write in and be like, come on guys, like, I'm a local artist. Of course my fans are nearby. We need actual, real, actual data. Things that make you inform decisions that you can make. That's what matters. Not that's some shit. That's meaningless. How many times in a row did someone listen to the track? That matters. It's meaningless. That's what I want to know. I want to know who is messing with me, and I want to build a business. And I always thought, like, you know what? The the, the traditional record companies um, wanted to obfuscate that data. They never built engineering inside their companies anyway. They never did a lot of things that were. You got most of you guys in this room are absolutely uh, more entrepreneurial than people who run record companies. Just know that for a fact. That's the reason why Ringtone's businesses was built right on cue. Ringtone businesses was built on their back. MTV was built on their back. The iPod and Apple was built on their back because they never once wanted to go hire people who could build products and invest in technology. It was making all that money selling us one song that we like for $16.99 and we bought it. There's a lot of hours you look at your CD collection, but I can't believe I bought this shit. <laughs> <laughs> and they made a fortune doing that. And like, and they got lazy. They had to figure out um, how to build other businesses. And now it's the entrepreneur's time now that music has been democratized, now that everybody has a camera on their phone, now that you can get your music out there to build your cottage business. All right, so let's go. Let's, uh, let's do a practical example of that. If you and if you had to pick any artist, let's go with you, uh, kid and play. You're a kid and play today, right now. Where would you start? How would you work it? What would be your priorities for how you manage that business? Well, Kid and Play, Kid, kid and Play were, were probably the best examples. They were big pop stars, right? Yeah, but they were they were also like most of the monetization. So then let's, 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 you know, back in back in uh, let's talk about okay, the year '89, '88, '89. Go look at the labels that these artists were on. You know who who owned these labels? Guys who had three fucking car washes. Some Italian guy with three car washes signed yeah. Rock Kim. Yeah, that's right. These they weren't signed to major labels. They were signed to Sleeping Bag Records, Select Records. And, yep. You know, yeah. and how did they do that? Rocket and skating rinks. I I grew up, I happen to be 48 years old, I'm in 1986, 
since I was 16, I've seen LLOJ do block parties. I've seen him rocking walls. Like, that was, that was happening on a regular basis. That wasn't, it was way before there was any opportunities. I just had dinner with Ralph McDaniels two nights ago who started Video Music Box. This guy, in 1983, worked at Public Access Television, and they weren't playing black music on MTV when that had just started in 82. That was then. So what he did was, um, WNYC, which is Public Access uh, uh, Television, he worked there as an intern, and they did electronic press kits. So you'd see three artists, uh, an artist, you know, three members of a group singing, or four members of a group singing, um, introduce themselves, and then be like, hi, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, where's your album? Or whatever. He would clip the beginning of the talking part and just use the singing part, and then put that on the air as a video. And that's how videos started. Black videos and then rap videos started to electronic press kits. Then he took that idea, started going on site, going to where the culture was taking place, reported by, created this whole thing, you know, shout outs, shout outs, that whole thing. He created that whole movement. He took the idea to MTV. He was going. They said, nah, this is a bad idea. Three years later, they go to the MTV raps. Just rob this man. You know what he did? Because he's an entrepreneur and he's resourceful, he started producing videos, produced everybody's video. Tony Braxton, TLC, had the biggest production company, and the guys that used to sweep the floors for him, the guys that used to do lighting for him, Hype Williams, Little X, Paul Hunter, all got careers. Yeah, go look at Ralph McDaniels. And that's, a, that's about building it because you have to. And you have, and just take control and do whatever you want. That's right. right. Yeah, it's called people without options either quit or become resourceful. Real entrepreneurs become resourceful. You don't start looking at the wall in front of you and go, oh, I can't get beyond this wall. I'm going to get beyond this wall. How, how am I going to think about it? Most people who weren't really about that life, after MTV robbed them, would be sitting around in a bar, getting drunk, saying, you know, that was my idea. And they'd be like, hey, get the fuck out of here. That wasn't your idea. That's, a, that's like a fucking, that's like a, 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 a highway to depression. Like, you really don't know that that was my idea? No. You had a video show? Get out of here. But the tools right now are better than they've ever been in history. Ever, ever. That's what I'm saying. I love the fact that the, 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 the room is filled with entrepreneurs. And I just want, like, don't get caught up in the world in the hype of being an entrepreneur. Understand you got to be comfortable with not knowing how to make payroll. got to be comfortable with not knowing um, how you're going to actually make it happen. There's a lot of times you go into, you got to run towards darkness, right? The unknown is exactly where it's at, right? you got to be fearless in those regards. Um, and if you're really, really built for that, then yes, being an entrepreneur is the right thing. I'm not saying being an entrepreneur is for everybody. In fact, there's a lot that I went to, I wouldn't recommend to anybody. But right now, uh, if you're in the music business, and I figure most of you guys in this room are here, because you're in the music business in some shape, form, or fashion, it's the best time ever. It's the best time ever um, to build your business. And I hope I answered your question about kid play right now. Because I'm saying I go back to the bus, it's, it's roller skating where it's, it's malls, it's, it's, it's building your business. It's really, uh, and, and knowing that you can build your business and using technology and using the tools that's available um, to accept the fact that you don't have to be, you know, the biggest artist in the world. You just need to keep moving up the incrementally. Yeah, like the, let me see if I got to distill this, but I think it's super important. Because I asked you a question, like, what would you do practically? And I was like, I was looking for a list of, like, do this, do X, Y. What you said was, make fans. Right? And that, that's different than uh, trying to get a deal or go and access this or get to this level. You just said, go build a business, go make fans, go delight people, right? Yeah. And I, I think there's a part of that that um, we should talk about, which is that when does help come? Right? There's a bunch of people in here probably like, I'm working really hard, I'm working on this, I'm shooting this, I got some fans, I play the show. At what point will I get help? And this is like, we see at least on the venture side, um, but we're really honest about it with people. Help will come to your aid when you need it least. 
<laughs> um, do you agree with that? I think that's also true in this moment. Like, when does when is someone going to lend a hand and help, like, raise me up? Is it is it coming? Should people be looking for it, or are they on their own? I'd say don't expect it. Um, if your B plan is help, you got a problem. Um, I think that you have to, if you're an entrepreneur, you get comfortable. I, when I was coming up in the business, I was fortunate enough to be that era. And there's a couple people in this room from that era, Shanti and, and Sean, like who've known me for many, many years. And they would say things like, you, you ask this question, very logical question, like how are we going to get this thing done? And, could we, how, and they'd be like, make it happen. That would be the an answer. Like, the answer was literally that big. And you would listen to that and be like, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, that, and that's really what I'm saying right now. Like, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of what I'm saying to you right now. Like, it's, that, you want to help make it happen. That's the help. Like, if you are really an entrepreneur, and there's nothing wrong with not being an entrepreneur. I don't want that word entrepreneur to be cool. So people who are not entrepreneurs and got good jobs and are building great teams and are part of a great team feel like they're not contributing, because that's not true. You know, it's not necessarily fair that the word entrepreneur is glorified and people aren't showing the other side of it. I, I just released a documentary um, with uh, LeBron James and Albert Carter on um, HBO called Student Athlete. And what we highlight is old people who don't make it when you go to college and you get hit up and you think you're going to be something, and then you end up on pain medication and depressed, or you end up not knowing how to, can't walk properly, and there's no medication, then the college no longer cares for you, or you get thrown out of college because you took a thousand dollars because you were sleeping on couches and you needed some help, and like taking money uh, violates NCAA rules. These are all bullshit rules, and this is all a system that needs to be. Um, it's by the way, the court of law is in there right now. Uh, it, it, it is by the way, slavery. Um, but my point of the matter is, until you see the other side of it, you'll keep thinking entrepreneurship is good. How do you know me, Mark Zuckerberg, the second, third? There's the other side of it, which is what we showed with all the athletes. There's also that same side of entrepreneurs where you know entrepreneur, you try it, you try it, it really wasn't about that life, and now you're looking both ways at 53 years old, fucked up because you was doing the wrong shit, but that's, that really wasn't your life. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Now, tech has the same thing, right? Which is, I think there's a, it's an evidence that these two communities can actually collaborate and work together and move forward if you acknowledge those issues. But the same thing exists in tech, right? The advice is go make it happen. Like how many times do you stand with your engineering team and they're like, you're like I think you should go like this. And they're like, how are we going to do that? I don't know. Make it, then they go figure out how to make it happen. It's the same kind of, uh, there's the same kind of like you have to create it and put it together. How, like, you're in a unique position where you have sort of elite venture capital, you have elite cultural currency, you have the ability to hire world class engineers. Um, I'm, I'm guessing there's still probably still some road to travel and, and still some struggle like combining yeah, those two things, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how like, we all have to figure out how to do that. It's not, yeah, that, 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 that's good that you have. It's like, man, you got flour and you got water. Now you're gonna make the best cake in the world. No, no. I got the ingredients to do it. What else do you need, right? It, it, there's all the nuances that go patience, love. Uh, um, uh, you need to be passionate while you're doing it. Oh, it's all of those things that that matter. And in this situation, what I need is that everybody realizes I don't need to go to a record company anymore. That's probably the number one thing that you need. Because if you put out a product and people are like, ah, uh, I still want to do that, then they're missing the entire point. And I've seen companies fail just because they were there too early. In fact, you know, guilty. Yeah. yeah. You know, you started a beautiful company. You guys were building tools to help artists go independent. The problem was the drug of record companies was still there. Yeah, that's right. You know, and once the drug of record companies there, bail you out. 
Then all of a sudden you look at tools, it's like, ah, that's what they have to do with the guys who can't make it. The guys who can make it, we're gonna get a record deal. Meanwhile, they don't even realize the terms and conditions and the long-term effects of that contract. You guys would just have to be early because the uh, marketplace wasn't ready um, to be fully independent yet and, 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 yeah, and yeah. appreciate independent as a gift. Now, we didn't execute as well as we could have on, in that opportunity, but we definitely faced the moment. I'm talking about uh, Tostin, anybody here remembers uh, Tostin. Um, we had uh, the artists who were most successful on our platform who were new uh, left us. They, they, they went off and signed somewhere and they took the check and went and left and they stopped using the platform. Yeah. And the artists that made the most money were the legacy artists who were like, to your point, were like, I'm over it. I'm not licensing it, I'm gonna control it myself. And they were, and that was sort of became our bread and butter. Um, but we didn't execute, we didn't give people tools that were easy enough to use, that they understood, that worked on their phones. Like, we didn't, like, you can just lie. No, 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 it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's not when you're early, when you're building something early, you're going to make a mess. You know, I, I, uh, I counsel, um, a company, a woman started a uh, product line in Brooklyn, and she was making um, beauty products in her home. And, you know, you'd order the mail, and the shit would be leaking, and the bath salts would end up in the cardboard, and all kinds of stuff. And I came in and I knew nothing about the beauty business. I just knew that this woman had an audience, and that if I don't put money behind her, who is? Like, she's not Estee Lauder, in my eyes. And, like, somebody's going to come put money behind Estee Lauder, who's going to put money behind her. And in the beginning, they were growing pains. You know, we can charge your credit card twice by accident. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of shit. So now, I stop, why we gotta stop, all kind of things. And yet, our efforts were rewarded because every, it was clear what our mission was. And I would go and talk, and I would talk to black women all the time. I'd be like, man, I, I get this wrong that you go inside of a, of a, of a, of a Target or Walmart and you gotta buy your products where it says ethnic beauty kit. I think that's fucked up. <laughs> you know, so there was a hole in the market that was so big that our mistakes were tolerated because that shit was disgusting, right? And I think when you look at all the stories of artists who had record deals yeah. and thought they had some shit. I mean, Prince wrote Slave on his face, and I remember thinking this guy is just eccentric, because, like, who would do that? And you realize he was just giving us game too early. I mean, he wasn't ready for it. He left me in the parking lot at Paisley Park one day, like, oh, it's on the internet? Never mind. We flew all the way there, and we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but he was right. He like he had control over it and knew he wasn't gonna do like. I disagree with him about the internet, but he definitely was like, "This is mine. This is my business. I'm gonna run it." Yeah, he did. You disagree with him about the internet because he was early. Right. When you're early, you're gonna make mistakes. It's not. It's not wrong with that. I'm not gonna do that. He was early. You guys made mistakes too early. You didn't make mobile friendly. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You're gonna make mistakes where it's early, it, it, and it's fine. You know, you don't have the opportunity to see footsteps that was there before you. So you make your own footsteps and they may not all head in the right direction. You know, when guys came to America and they all go on the East Coast and they started going west, I had to tell some of my guys early on who were building the company. How did they know when they were going west that the Mississippi River wasn't the Pacific Ocean? They just kept fucking going. You just gotta keep going. And that's what survives as an entrepreneur. You got, it's nothing but trees and there's darkness and things that you don't understand. But you've got to keep going if you're committed to the cause. So if Prince was around today, of course he could have embraced the internet. He, it was just too early. He didn't understand it. But the fact of the matter is, they tried to put this man out of business. He changed his name. He made, sh like, you know what? I'm going to give the album away. Uh, for a free ticket, is it kind of a sound scan so you can chart number one? 
Then he changed the rules of so wind shot number one. They, by the way, it sounds like college sports, right? It's the same thing. It's always to uh, force you as a uh, business to keep the business alive. They build a moat around their business and protect their business by keep changing the rules in order to keep and protect their thing. They do the same thing with voting laws. They do the same thing with the NCAA sports. And they've done the same thing historically in music business. And how does it mean that?
that I could have put my money in or could have applied the same principles that I learned from the music business in it. And that's the one thing about um, education, but more importantly, intelligence, natural intelligence. It, you learn whatever, right? Like whatever you're doing right now, I can take you out of that right now and put you in something else, give you six months and you'll know that. But if you don't use that skill, then you are allowing yourself to have a narrow vision and not allowing yourself to be more understanding of other industries. And I wish, not that I wanted to lose focus, but at least I had some understanding of other industries where my money could have created value for me, but I didn't. Thank you. All right, that's a good one. So I'll take a moment down front here, please. Hi, um, thank you so much for talking to us today. Uh, my name is Shayola, it runs with Crayola, a lot of people call me Kiko. I'm from Scarborough, Canada. Hi guys. Um, I used to manage a couple of studios. Uh, now I work at Patrick Recording Studios here in Atlanta. And I do events for them, I also DJ. One thing I really, really struggle with is identifying my audience. You talk about data a lot, or not data, but yeah. I want to know what are some ways I can identify my audience, especially when I do events? Well, I can tell you that my, our solution for it is leveraging technology so that we're using music streams as the sort of lead signal to help you find well, a combination of, of, of music streams and social data to help you find your audience. What you're doing right now, it's, it's, literally, it's more, much more hand-to-hand -hand combat. I'm telling you, Kevin Hart would say he, when he first started in comedy, whether he won or lost, he would actually go and collect people's email addresses. <laughs> like, he literally did that, right? Um, I'm not saying go do that, but I'm saying it is kind of like that. It really is about responding to people in comments and using DM as a powerful tool to, for business purposes. You know what I'm saying? As a powerful tool for business purposes and, 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 and getting some sense of who these people are and what you're doing that they like. What are the songs that you're playing? What are you wearing when you show up that matters? So you can actually get tighter and tighter because without getting that feedback and being open-minded to that feedback, you would never be able to keep pushing forward. But it's not, I don't have a grand answer for you other than it really is hand -hand, but you gotta, but you gotta really do it. You gotta really absolutely do it because it's easy for me to say that and for you to go, yeah, that makes sense. And then next week, It'd be like, yo, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds. And the first day is all veggies. Second day is back to the day before you ate the veggies. We all have done that, right? And you don't want to do after this if this is what you really care about.
in anything in business that is undervalued for reasons that make no sense. Like, why did St. Anthony Beauty care? You obviously, black women didn't like that, so there was clearly an opportunity to build something that would fill that void, because now we're just talking about like self-respect. And then I like, add a little science to it, you're like, you mean like a white girl who looks at Beyonce and wants to do her hair like that? Now she has to buy her products in that, I think you know? Right? That makes no sense. So when you apply that kind of rational thought to industries, you start to realize where these gaping holes are because legacy businesses actually leave big blind spots to what culture is resourcing. Right? They, they, just, they just don't. It's not like when they built Netflix, they knew that people would be using other people's accounts. <laughs> they, they, it's like, culturally, there's things that just take place that people are so far removed from, they don't really get a chance to understand how people are really moving. And the reason why I call my business translation is because of that. Because there's always something to be translated. There's always industries that need the insight on what's taking place in culture to be applied, right, to some enterprise. Um, so that's, 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 that's the lens in which I look at it through is, what are they doing that they completely miss it, that regular, common people who wake up every day and have to hit the ground are thinking about, and what's their user experience? And if you can figure out if there's a gap in between that, there's a business there, okay? And there's another thing that you need to know in any business. When there's mysteries in the margin, that means there's a problem, you know? Mysteries in the margin, okay? Thank you. All right, can we get one more? How are you doing on time? One more. Okay, all right. I think I give you the I'll 20 bucks. Oh, let's go on, sorry. Let's Oh, yeah. Give me a lady, man. Okay. Give me a lady, man. Sorry. Oh, we should do it. You're right. We're going to do a little off-site. We got you. We got you. Thank you. Perfect. Your name? Hi, my name is Lemoy. I'm from Toronto. Yeah, yeah.
He bet the business conditions. I bought my company back. 30 cents on the dollar. That same company is a company that six years later I got the funding from Google and Peterson Cars. So I needed it. I found a strategic partner. I kept that strategic partner on a short lease. This is not going to be because I got money from you, you control me, and then I become a 2% no. You know, I'm not going to be, I'm not that. I'm going to be who I am the full way. And as soon as you win, I'm going to put this thing up for business because it's you. Forget anybody else, it's you. You raised the 1.5 million, right? You did that. So if anybody wants to go in business, you have to understand what makes you special and not try to take that away from you just because they gave you money. So find a strategic partner. There's a woman right now on the cover of um, a fast company. Yeah, who raised all that money in Silicon Valley. Like, and it, it, it was great because then there's other women telling their story about raising money and, 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 and whatnot and being enterprising. Believe in yourself and don't let anybody move you up that margin. If they do, you got to threaten to move or move. Because once you allow that to take place, you're done. 